before the Son of God made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. The world was in turmoil. The Israelites often found themselves warring against their neighbors, ultimately being subdued and taking, taken into captivity. While in captivity, Daniel interpreted a dream for the king of Babylon. In that dream was an image that represented Babylon and the kingdoms that would follow. Babylon was represented by a head of gold, the Medo-Persians by uh, the chest and arms made of silver. Alexander the Great and the Greeks were represented by the belly and thighs of bronze. And then the Roman Empire represented by legs of iron with feet of iron mingled with clay. War was common, and power shifted frequently. But with the arrival of Christ, the heavenly host declared glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Yet for the past 2,000 years, peace is still a rare condition. If we only consider the conflicts involving the United States, that list is staggering. The American Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Desert Storm. Did Jesus fail? Was the heavenly host mistaken in Luke chapter 2? I submit to you that the peace promised by the scriptures does not have reference to national circumstances but personal relationships. How do we as children of God and servants in his kingdom prepare ourselves to pursue peace? One, Christians are to strive to be at peace with our fellow man. Second, we must be at peace with God. Now let's examine these aspects during this lesson and think about what they mean as we deal with those who are around us, as we prepare ourselves to pursue biblical peace. First, let's look at what inspiration teaches about peace with our fellow man. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, Paul has quite a few things to say about peace and vengeance. He says, beginning in verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How difficult are these words? Someone has wronged you. Perhaps they have stolen something from you or they've physically harmed you. What is your first inclination? I'm going to get him. I'll make him pay for that. God says no. Don't react in that way. Repay no one evil for evil. Look again at verse 18. If it is possible... As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. We cannot control how another person acts. What we can control is how we react. If there is a conflict, don't get caught up in it. Don't make it worse. Do what you can do to be at peace with your fellow man. 
Friends, we cannot be apathetic about this. We cannot show no interest, feel no enthusiasm, have no concern. We cannot be indifferent or passive or lukewarm. Paul says in Romans 14 and verse 9, I'm sorry, 19, therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. We must pursue it, seek it eagerly. You don't just wait for it to happen. You do what you can do to make it happen. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 22, Paul tells the young preacher to flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If we are not actively seeking peace with others, even those in this world with whom we are in disagreement, those who are against us, if we're not trying to reconcile and pursue that peace, then we're not fulfilling the Lord's command. We must turn away from evil and do good. We must seek peace peace and pursue it. 1 Peter 3.11. Now just as we are to seek peace with our fellow man, we must also seek peace with God. Men often sought out Christ to heal their loved ones. One example of this is recorded for us in Mark chapter 5, in which a ruler of the synagogue came to the Lord and he requested Jesus come heal his daughter. Beginning in verse 25 there, talking about on their journey. There were a lot of people around. And in verse 25, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had suffered many things from many physicians and she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes. I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you? And you say, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your afflictions. Why was the woman healed? Simply because she had touched his garment? Jesus told her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Similarly, at the Pharisee's house in Luke chapter 7. I'm not going to read the full account right now, but it's in, in verses 36 through 50. He told the woman who washed his feet there with her tears, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. With whom did these women now have peace? And what is the connection between faith and peace? The same peace that Jesus offered to the Jews during his time on earth was also offered to the Gentiles in the years following his return to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, Paul says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by the hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel 
and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Through faith in Christ, we can have peace not only with each other in the church, but with God himself. Because of his action on the cross, the blood that he shed has taken away the enmity and has separated us from God. Does this mean that our lives will be free from conflict when we obey the Lord? What does inspiration say? Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Wait, what? We have peace with God, but we still have tribulations knowing that tribulations produce, produces uh, perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Peace with God does not guarantee the absence of conflict in this life. We are still going to face tribulation. We need to see that tribulation as an opportunity to grow, to develop that perseverance and character and hope that God desires us to possess. We need to recognize that peace with God sometimes causes conflict with man. The Lord said in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. At a glance, this seems to fly in the face of Christ's mission, but keep reading. Matthew 10, 35, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Accepting the word of the Lord can cause disagreements with those who refuse to hear and obey him. As difficult as it may be, we must always remember that peace with God is more important than peace with man, even family. Jesus told the apostles prior to his arrest and crucifixion. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We too can have peace in Christ regardless of what is happening around us. We need to keep our eyes on the ultimate goal, eternal life with God when this is over. Christ came into this world to make peace between God and man. But we also need to spread his message of peace with God to all those who are around us. We should be spiritual peacemakers we need to prepare ourselves to do that. Prepare ourselves to pursue peace. A faithful Christian should be working to bring friends and family members into a peaceful relationship with the Almighty. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We have a great opportunity to teach those around us. Yes, we can worship we, we can invite them to worship with us to study with us invite them to special activities that the church is hosting at the building such as vbs or gospel meetings 
whatever those things may be. Those are important ways to reach out, but we need to personally prepare ourselves as well. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There are people in your life who need Jesus. Somebody just popped into your head, didn't they? Somebody who does not have that relationship that they need to have. Maybe they used to worship with you, but they've left. Maybe a friend or a coworker, a fellow student, a family member. You have a name or two in mind. What have you done this past week to lead them to Christ? Who knows whether or not you have come into someone's life for such a time as this. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. Perhaps God has placed you right where you are for the purpose of showing someone the peace that is available to them in Christ. Don't waste that precious opportunity that he has given to you. James chapter 3 and verse 18 says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Jesus died on the cross so that we, through his blood, might have peace with God. If we are to imitate him, then let us prepare ourselves to pursue that peace and to tell others about the peace that he offers. That's how we become peacemakers. That's how we sow the fruit of righteousness in peace. I'm going to leave you with two questions. Number one, are you at peace with God? And number two, have you prepared yourself to pursue peace with your fellow man? God bless.